Let's talk about Ready Player One. So to be honest, I wasn't actually planning on watching this movie today. When I went into the gym to watch my movie because I can't sit down and watch a movie, I was all for watching the Justice League. And I was only going to watch the first half of it because I, I don't know how I'm going to find four hours in a day to watch it. And I'm never ever going to watch Josh Moon's version, partly because he's a terrible human being and partly because that Justice League just sounds like the worst movie ever. So that's not going to happen. But I've been wanting to see Zack Snyder's Justice League ever since it was announced. Not so much because I'm so much interested in the film or the film franchise. I have yet to find a DC film that I have loved, although I think Shazam is a good time. And the first Wonder Woman's fine. I honestly think Shazam is their best film so far. I'm kind of excited about some of the stuff they have in the future, but I've yet to see anything of theirs that I've loved. And honestly, Zack Snyder's vision of Superman and having just watched Batman vs. Superman I really wasn't all that interested or excited. What I was was interested in though, what I was excited about was the idea of the remake of a movie. And it's not the first time it happens. Of course, one of the most famous examples is the Donner Cut or perhaps Magnificent Ambersons, although Magnificent Ambersons never did get the uh, fulfillment that the Donner Cut did with Superman 2. But it's happened time and time again, and a lot of people have talked about it, and it's not a new thing. And so when people say, oh no, this new Justice League movie, it's the end of all films, and it's it's giving in to, to people and democracy. What a terrible idea. I don't think it's a bad thing, and certainly not the first time it's happened. It's happened for a very long time. Big, billion-dollar studios often will destroy an artist's film, and then the studio will come back in and remake the artist's film, and the studio profits off of both. So the real people winning isn't us, right, the viewers, although we do get to see perhaps the original version, just like I watched the ultimate edition of uh, Batman vs. Superman. The real winner here is obviously Warner Brothers. They just sold the movie twice and made twice the amount of money, and no one's really talking about that, which is kind of strange, but I, I didn't watch Justice League because as I walked into the gym, my iPad decided that I was going to watch Ready Player One. I must have accidentally bumped into something or hit something, but that's the movie I started watching. And I thought, you know what? This is only two hours and I've yet to see a Steven Spielberg movie I like. So maybe, maybe this is gonna be the one. And I've heard kind of mixed reviews about it. So I knew it probably wouldn't be, but I've only seen Jaws and E.T. and Schindler's List, and so I really haven't seen a lot of Spielberg's work. So I thought, well, maybe this is a good way to, to finally get into Spielberg. <sighs> it wasn't. It's not. So, going into this film, I had very low expectations. I really didn't expect much out of the film. And the fact that it didn't meet those tiny standards really says a lot about the film. I think it's interesting that it was promoted as a non-animated film, as like a, I don't know, a live action film, because it's really not. It's actually an animated film with live action moments in it. And you can kind of see that where Spielberg is really struggling, which Spielberg, although I know he's made animated films in this past, He's not a very good animation director. He's, I, I think, you know, despite the fact I don't really like Spielberg's films I've seen, he definitely has an eye for directing and he is good at it in a lot of his own unique and interesting ways. And while I don't like Jaws, there are a lot of really cool and interesting moments. And not just talking about the practical effects, but how he uses the camera and just his eye and vision for filmmaking is really interesting. But when whenever it's animated, it's just, boring and uninteresting and the constant just references to all of these different films and pop culture which I know the book is about and I haven't read the book so maybe the book doesn't do this well either but it just feels like it's only being done so people can feel like they're noticed like it's cool it, it, it also feels like this book was written by someone 
whose son or daughter is a gamer and the, the person who wrote it is in their 50s and is trying to like be cool like them like the way they use the slang is very off and wrong a lot of the time and it I don't know how like it almost I cringe and it hurts when I hear them even as someone who doesn't really understand games or video games even I'm like that's not really how you use that and it just feels so kind of shoved in and just pointless and stupid that it is frustrating if nothing else but I I give it to them I guess I, I, at least they're trying but I think the real film isn't inside the Oasis as strange as that sounds. I think the most interesting part of the film is everything that happens outside the Oasis. It's when you can see Spielberg actually trying to make a movie. And again, much like the last few films I talked in the past, it's actually multiple films. And the film outside of the Oasis is kind of an interesting film. I mean, it's this ragtag group of team who basically break into the highest security, multi-billion dollar industry in the world. And that's kind of really interesting. And they kind of just move past that so they can focus on the video game stuff and how cool video games are. And what's strange is when you're introduced to this world, it's not really seen as a bad thing. Everyone kind of trapped in their oasis. It's almost painted as a sort of utopia which is strange because it seems to me that, especially how the film tries to end, it seems to me that the message is to spend outside with family and in the real world. But it doesn't really paint the world that way. I mean, it paints this sort of dystopia. It's, um, I like to think of it, it's, I call it Hollywood poor, which is that Hollywood has this really strange idea of what poverty is. And just, I mean, having seen poverty and, you know, having, I wouldn't say experienced it, although, you know, not having a ton of money growing up, I know what poverty looks like. I, I've worked in impoverished areas. I've lived in areas that were impoverished. I know what poverty looks like, and it never looks like how it does. Like, Hollywood's poverty is what the rest of the world would call middle class, even Americans. And that's kind of what's going on here. Like it's, they're actually like pretty nice houses. And the fact that he is so impoverished, I suppose, that he, you know, has to live in like the, I don't know, 52nd floor of this stacks of trailers or what have you, but can still afford an oasis. How does that work? Or why does that work? How does the economics of this world exist? It seems like you, they said uh, at some point, like the coins, there's like a newspaper that says the coins are like the new money. And I understand that's kind of sort of a reference to Bitcoin. If you don't really understand how Bitcoin works or why Bitcoin works, but it just doesn't really make any sense. How do you pay for things in the real world? Are the real, is the real world paid? by the Oasis, and if the Oasis is created, how is there no competition? How has IOI not invented their own version of Oasis? I get that, sure, at first, when it first comes out. No competition back in, what's in 2027 is when the first version comes out? Okay, it's alone. But let's just look at virtual reality today. I mean, count the amount of different virtual reality mechanisms there are out there. How is Oasis the only one? And maybe, like, sure, Oasis is the the Google or the Instagram or the, the, the Facebook or, you know, it's kind of like, sure, there are others, but this is kind of the big one. I'll buy into that, but there has to be others. There's no way IOI, the competing company, I think it's not really clear how that works either. How have they not built their own Oasis? Like, I'm not saying like I'm, I'm a pure capitalist or anything of that nature, but there has to be some sort of, how has no one else built an Oasis? Has no one else thought, hey, maybe we should build something like this. They have a complete monopoly and no one questions that at any moment in the film. And it's a very Willy Wonka style film, isn't it? It, it reminds me of a, a worse version of Willy Wonka because you have these you know exciting characters and they're going into this magical world and they're basically given a bunch of tests that they have to pass. And seven years go by before anyone figures out the first test. And apparently it's just Wade Watts is the only one who can figure it out for some reason. And all he does to pass the first test is he goes backwards, which it's like, oh, okay, that's, that's kind of a fun idea. 
that was not one person figured that out. Like in seven years, not one person just walked out. Like if, if it was me, I would have just like stepped out of my car and just kind of looked around or like walked backwards. How is no one? Eh? But okay, he figures out. He's the first one to figure it out. And that's fine, I guess, whatever, no big deal. So he gets the first key and then there's the whole thing with Artemis, which is just, I don't care, honestly. I, like, think of the way the relationship works. He knows about her because he has been watching her Twitch streams for years. And so the moment he meets her, he is in lo love with her. And then she loves him because it's a movie? There's not really a good reason to love Wade Watts. I don't understand why everyone likes him so much. It's not like he's doing anything that interesting. I think uh, the side character H, Helen, I think is her name, played by uh, an actor whose name I can't remember, but I, I love her and everything I've seen her in. She's so much more interesting of a character. Like her, how she exists in the world is, is really interesting. She's, you know, this builder and this creator and she's this successful business person just kind of existing in this oasis and using it as an economy to create this amazing existence. And what exactly is it that Wade Watts does? Like, like be, before the race, what was it that he did in the oasis? Or what is it that he does in the oasis at all? And then the whole thing with his aunt and her shitty boyfriend dying, they kind of go over that pretty fast. And the reason I kind of want to jump to these two seemingly different things at the same time is because Wade Watts as a character is not a good or interesting character. Within moments of his aunt dying, he's over her, which I get it, it's not his mom, but that's his only family. It's the only person he knows. And he's just like, yeah, like there's not even a moment to kind of pause and be like, oh man, my, like the only family member I know has died. I'm not sure it's, if it's because Wade Watts is a terrible human being or why, why else? I, I'm not really sure. I, I, I fail to grasp how this terrible thing happens to him and he's just like, oh, better go back to playing my game and getting those keys. And how is IOI not able to catch him? Like, this is a multi-billion dollar company. I certainly buy that they will go out and murder this boy, especially for the amount of money on the table. I 100% buy that. But how are they so bad at it? And I get he joins Resistance and there's all that. But that only works if he joins Resistance before any of that stuff happens. Because otherwise, there, there's just no way. They have all this technology, they're a multi-billion dollar company. Also, the, the way they go about trying to kill him, that doesn't make sense. A big explosion, why would you do that? You're a multi-billion dollar company. If I was a multi-billion dollar company, if I ran a multi-billion dollar company, I would hire 10 assassins. I'll go kill this guy. One of them's definitely gotta kill the guy. There is no way you would have a giant explosion. And I get it's like, oh, but they're poor and it's in the poor area and no one cares about the ghetto. Sure, I guess, although again, not understanding poverty, they all seem really well-dressed for people impoverished, and they all seem to not really ever be struggling for anything. And again, it goes back to how do people make money in this world? Do people have real jobs? Because they have to. There's people that have to be running the infrastructure. How does water work? How do they eat in this real world? How does that economy at all work in any sort of way? And I think Spielberg kind of missed the point of the movie, which I get it, it's based off the book, and this isn't what the book was about. But you can see at the beginning of the movie that there's this really interesting world that Spielberg kind of attempts to create. And it's really intriguing and interesting, and there are a lot of things that could happen in this world. And I think of almost a sort of total recall kind of thing. I, I kind of feel like this is a total recall kind of world where things are kind of controlled by the, these government powers. And first of all, and, and if, if I, IOI is going, or the head of IOI is going to get arrested at the end of the film, I don't buy that. I, I really don't. A multi-billion dollar company is going to be stopped by the police. That's absolutely ridiculous. Or let's just take a moment to talk about when he is walking 
to capture Wade Watts at the end of the film. He, for some reason, decided to create a giant explosion, didn't work. Wade Watts is in the resistance, which fine, I'll buy that. Although why the resistance is led by a 16 year old girl, I'm not really sure. And I'm not saying it's like, oh, if it was a six year old boy, that would be different. Why is, why is there someone not in their like 20s or 30s leading this resistance? Cause 16 just seems a little, and I get it's like, it's video games, but if the Oasis has been around for as long as it seems to have been, which is like 20 some odd years, there has to be people who have been playing since they were kids and who are much better at this than them, but apparently not. So the 16 year old kid, is leading resistance and she gets him to safety somehow fine again mulling over just the most interesting parts like how how does he flee that that is such, that's a such a possibly interesting scene and the idea of the resistance in the real world is really interesting but they just kind of ignore that i guess and so at the end of the film, there's this car chase, and the car chase is actually an interesting part of the film. I, I really enjoyed myself. I'll be honest, there were a lot of times in the film where I was checking how much longer the film was. The first hour, I would say, went by really fast. I, I was kind of enjoying the film, I was really getting into it, and then after the first hour, it just got slower and slower and slower and slower. Like after I realized that getting the second key, the shining key, that there was still another hour of the movie. I was like, what? How is there another hour to this film? You've already done the most interesting things. Clearly the most interesting thing about this movie is getting the keys. <sighs> and the thing with The Shining, when I heard that music, I was like, oh, remember how great of a movie that was? The Shining is one of my favorite films. And whenever I hear that music, I'm just put in that place and just the, the sense and just the tone and, and you're just you're part of it and I don't know if they recreated the room or if they rebuilt the set or if it's all digital I'm not really sure how they did that but it, if nothing else if the film fails in every other realm the recreation of The Shining however they did it is just masterful I, I genuinely felt for those few moments that I was back in The Shining and unfortunately it would remind me of what a better film The Shining is. And also with any of the reference to any movie, I was like, huh, those are all a lot better films than this. But this is the movie I'm watching and it's too late now. And the whole Shining sequence is just, it kind of fails to really grasp and understand. And I think this is my big problem with Spielberg and all of his work is he really fails to understand tension. I know people love the Jaws, they're like, oh, the Jaws, Jaws is the greatest movie of all time and talk about tension, but I don't think ten the tension actually works there either. I think Spielberg's greatest flaw is he doesn't really understand how to create tension in a film. There's the scene with the frick, the keys, oh my gosh. Who knew that watching someone put a key in a lock could be so boring? I mean, you know, going in, wow, that's gonna be boring. That's a really boring idea. Let's make it somehow more boring. And it is, and I get there's like a car chase going on, but the Oasis stuff, again, just super boring. And I don't care, like, at all, but I'm watching it, it's fine. And so going back to The Shining, it's, I think the homage is nice. The moment with the twins, and the naked woman and kind of the reaction interactions with uh, H and <laughs> the naked woman is a really intriguing moment and there's some kind of really fun things that they do and kind of nod back to all these different moments in The Shining. But what makes The Shining so great is The Shining is really, really slow. If you watch the first 30 minutes of the film, pretty much nothing happens. They meet a guy, they get the keys, and that's about it. And they're like kind of walking around. The film takes a long time to build up the horror. And even when they are building up horror, those scenes are so long. And Spielberg's just like, cut, 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 cut. Right, scary, 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 scary. That's not really how great horror works. I mean, I think of a Nightmare on Elm Street or a modern you know, horror film like Hereditary, 
Terry or Midsummer. What makes those films scary isn't the slasher aspects of it. Even a film like Black Christmas, like right, the original famous, the calls coming from inside the house. So much of that film, nothing really happens. It's a really slow film in a lot of really interesting ways. And I think all good horror films, even Saw and the like, have a certain amount of patience to them. Now, of course, those kind of films get into a, a, a certain sort of gore and, and fetishize that sort of thing. And I know this isn't that, and it's a PG-13 rating, although if you're Spielberg, you can pretty much do whatever you want, honestly. But there's just no tension. The Shining is this moment to create genuine horror. I, I think what Spielberg didn't recognize and what a, honestly a better director or if I'm being truly honest, a younger director, the fact that they chose someone, <sighs> although Spielberg, I'm not saying Spielberg's a bad director. I, as I said, you know, from a technical standpoint, there's a lot of great things that Spielberg does, but let's be honest, Spielberg is a white man in his seventies. Why is he the one hired to play, to do Ready Player One, other than the fact that his name's Spielberg? There's no good reason. Honestly, I would much have preferred a younger director, someone in their even late 20s or early 30s, a first time or second time director take, and I know this kind of film costs a lot of money, so they don't want to put someone new in it, but a younger director could have made much more of this film because in many ways it's a series of genre films and Spielberg doesn't get that. He's so obsessed with his own Spielbergism, I call it, which is just this specific genre I think all Spielberg films kind of fall under, that he misses that The Shining scenes, act, whatever you want to call it, if you had ingrained those in horror, you could have just made a short horror film. I, I think this film will have actually worked better as a series of short films that you put together, where you have, say, the racing film, you have the horror film, you have the action film, and there's obviously these non sully for films, including The Terminator. I, I do like the scene where the Iron Giant is floating into metal and he puts up his thumb obviously referencing Terminator 2, another film I like, did not enjoy, though I'm surprised to say this, enjoyed a lot more than this film. <sighs> because the worst thing I can say about this film, or the worst thing I can say about any film, is that it's lazy filmmaking. It's a filmmaker who clearly just doesn't really care that much. I mean, sure, the Terminator has a ton of problems, and Terminator 2, I would say, has a lot more problems but it's clear that when James Cameron is making these films he cares a lot about these films he genuinely cares a lot about these characters even if I think he's misguided in what he thinks is good filmmaking at this point watching Ready Player One it feels like lazy filmmaking it feels like a filmmaker who just doesn't actually care that much about the film he's making which is a strange thing to say about Spielberg, because I know he's someone who loves movies and loves cinema, and yet for someone who loves cinema, other than just saying the names of films, there's very few references, which is strange because this Ready Player One was made to be, I mean, obviously it was a book first, but it was so ingrained in film culture and could have, so much could have been done with it, although you'd have to make Wade Watts a much more interesting character. Maybe he is in the book and Maybe the hero isn't Wade Watts, maybe it's H, or even Artemis, or any of the other characters. I also think it's strange that Sho, the 11-year-old kid, which they keep making jokes about as if it's funny, it's not. It's kind of strange that they don't realize that most of the people you're probably playing with are like 10, 11-year-old kids. That's kind of how video games works, and it's weird that they're surprised by this. It's it's fascinating how they write characters who, although are, are these experts in video games, don't really understand that much about, like even I understand more about it. Like if I saw 11 year old in real life, someone I've been playing video games for years with, I'd be like, yeah, that seems about right. Like that's exactly what I would guess. It's strange that you don't see that. And that comes back to the biggest flaw of the film, which beyond Spielberg's, I think, laziness and refusal to 
play with these really cool genres and just kind of make a bunch of films and put them together. I would have loved to make this film, not because I'm interested in what he wants or that story at all. The story's been told a trillion times and there's nothing unique or interesting about it. It's just Willy Wonka, but not as good. So I'm not really interested in that. What, what is interesting about the story is Spielberg had the opportunity to make a bunch of short films, genre films, and ma mash them together and just have a good time. And he refuses to do that. And I don't really know why. And I think this butts up against what I keep saying, what I keep saying I'm going to say is, is the big problem of the film, which is what are the stakes, honestly? What are the stakes of the film? I, I really don't know. Perhaps the reason I'm interested in the real world is because there are actual stakes. Wade Watts being chased, being attacked, being almost murdered, there's real stakes to that. And I can immediately, although they're, again, lazy stakes, like just killing him, like you don't have anything else. And I, I know that they try to bribe him at first, and, but they're, they go past it really quickly, which is strange. You think they put a little more effort into it. I know like the bad guys, oh, big bad guy, blah, 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 blah. But it's, it's one of those things where the bad guy is just a bad guy to be a bad guy and there's no real motivations for him, which just makes him another just really boring and uninteresting character as a whole. But as far as inside the Oasis, I don't see the stakes. Like, I, I don't understand the stakes at all. Who cares about an army attacking another army. They just respawn. There's no actual like physical harm done. I guess you lose all of your stuff, which is, okay, why is it, who cares? <laughs> Honestly, and I guess maybe if you have a key, you lose it. Although it's strange, they never really acknowledge that, that if they die, they lose their key. So I don't actually even know if that's the, I assume that's the case, although they never show it. I think it would have been helpful at some point one of them had to respawn, they had a key, and maybe there's a scene where they're trying to get the key back. That would have been much more interesting. It's also an interesting that you can just get an infinite amount of keys. I assume there was just one of each, and only one person could have it. And let's talk about how in the Oasis no one tries to kill him. That's a little weird. Like there's even an attempt at an assassination. If I was in the Oasis, I would def- and there are definitely some shitty people in the Oasis, there has to be, because there always is. I would definitely try to kill him. I mean, at least in Willy Wonka, the original Willy Wonka, when Charlie gets a golden ticket, they're like, hey, you need to leave. Someone's gonna steal- and this is just a golden ticket. This is just to see Willy Wonka's factory. At this point, you don't even know what you're getting into, right? You don't know that you could win the factory. All you know is that you get to see a chocolate fountain. That's literally the extent. And people are li quite literally willing to kill Charlie over it and yet no one's willing to kill for half a trillion dollars? That seems a bit strange. Also, how are they so bad at killing this one person? Not only in the real world, but in the Oasis. And even if they do kill him in the Oasis, does it matter? I mean, do they take the key? And there's infinite keys, so why does it matter? And why do they so quickly give up on trying to kill him, like in the Oasis? It's just, it just doesn't really make any sense. And it's, I think that's why the film drags so much is there's just no reason to care. There are no stakes. Even with all the other films before this, although Batman vs Superman, were there really stakes? Maybe. There's no stakes in this film at all. If they die in the Oasis, nothing really happens. I mean, I guess they sort of feel the pain because they're wearing those bodysuits. But why are they wearing those bodysuits? I 100% get why they would wear them if, say, they're going to go to, I don't know, meet with prostitutes or what have you. That makes sense. I don't know how Oasis works or if there's even computer-generated characters, because there doesn't really seem to be, which is something. I don't really understand why that that is the case. But that, I mean, I accept maybe the AI that is the creator of Oasis, which who is treated like a god, by the way. I don't really understand. I mean, it's cool, but I wouldn't like be like, wow, that's God. And maybe I just, I mean, I guess if I met Orson Welles, would I feel the same way about him? I guess 
maybe? I don't know. It's weird that there's no computer-generated characters. But the stakes are just so low. And it's just hard to care. And it's just resolved so quickly, in the real world especially. The guy comes in with his gun, which is... There's like a hundred people there, and this guy has one gun. First of all, you're telling me in this future world no one has guns? I want to live in that future world. That sounds like a utopia, if I'm being completely honest. Secondly, even if he has a gun, he's got six shots. And I get like, yeah, but like people don't want to die. There are people inches away from him. No one grabs his hand, which definitely would happen if no one had a gun, which definitely someone would have a gun, especially if you're in the slums, which supposedly you are, even though it doesn't really look like anyone's in the slums. So he just walks on by and then goes up to Wade Watts, who is just sitting around, I guess, admiring the Easter egg, which I I don't really think Steven Spielberg understands what an Easter egg is, but whatever. He's admiring his literal Easter egg, and he points the gun, the bad guy points the gun at Wade Watts. Expecting what? I genuinely don't know what his plan is at this point, which maybe he's just insane. I guess that's a plausibility, but with no plan at all. He points the gun, and then the police just arrive and arrest him, and that's just it. That's how the movie ends. Well, actually, no. It gets worse. The five of them get own the Oasis now, and even though he's supposedly talking about how, oh, we're fighting for the rights of everyone, he's not actually doing that, is he? Only him and his four friends own the Oasis. He's just become the new billionaire. And the fact that anyone falls in before that moment, I don't really understand. Like, I think it's cool there are people like, yeah, that guy's got the first key. And maybe he would have a devout following because people will literally follow anything. But there's no way basically everyone in Oasis is like, yeah, that's the guy I want to follow. Like, there has to be tons of people who are against him. And it's strange that the only people against Wade Watts is the IOI. There's just no way. Like, there's gotta be plenty of people out there like, this guy seems like an asshole. Also, why does he get it? Like, why are we even on his side? I don't really understand. And I get that IOI wants to have advertisements, but that's suggesting that before IOI had this plan, there are no advertisements. So how does this company make money? Like, I get that you can sell the software but it, it goes back to how, how the hell does this economy work? How, how does anything make money? And also, if they're so impoverished, how do they have Wi-Fi that is good enough unless Wi-Fi is... No, it's not free to everyone because at one point the CEO says, well, you could have high-speed internet, which... How does he not have high-speed internet? <laughs> and also, how much, like... Bandwidth is that taking up being in a virtual world all the time? How is no one glitching out ever? How are the poorest people supposedly in Columbus, Ohio, for, which is actually kind of cool. I think Columbus is a pretty cool place. They're still able to afford the internet app? How does that work? Someone explain that to me because I, I genuinely don't understand any of this. And then at the end of the day, Wade Watts is like, yeah. Everyone's still going to be the Oasis. We're basically still living in dystopia. But on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you can't be in the Oasis. That's not great. You were given the option to shut down the Oasis. Shut it down. It's not good, obviously. I mean, clearly people are ignoring their children and their parents and their spouses. And how is this not eventually going to lead to the end of humankind, like human population, which, how is there stacks? Because that assumes that there is more humans. How? Why is anyone procreating? You can just go into the Oasis and have pretty much whatever you want. Why would you procreate? And I'm not saying there aren't some that are, but the human population would be down significantly by this point. And if you're just going to have Tuesdays and Thursdays as the only days that the Oasis doesn't exist, I don't know if that's enough time. And it's also strange because I don't really understand this world because on one end it seems like everyone has an oasis. But then also there's moments where you'll see like lots of people just walking out of like, like business people just walking out of an office. Again, how, how does this economy work? How does this infrastructure work? Who's building these buildings? Who's 
like working the water or the electricity or the Wi-Fi? Who's living in the real world and how does that exist? It just doesn't make any sense. The whole film doesn't make any sense at all. And I'm okay with the film not making sense. I mean, the first time I watched Inception, I actually don't think Inception's that complicated a film. But I think of ending things. I don't really understand that film, but I love it. I love that film. But if your film's not gonna make sense, or at least not seem to make sense, it has to at least be entertaining. And because there are no stakes, it's not entertaining. So out of 10 thumbs, one thumb. This is genuinely the worst film I have seen in a really long time. Well over a year, probably. I'm glad that I watched it. It's just, there's nothing good to say about this film. I think the performances outside of H and maybe uh, the samurai and the ninja, the other performances are bad, including whoever plays, I can't remember the name of the actor who plays Bid Watts. It's not a good performance. And that's not to blame the actor. I don't think an actor should ever be playing for a performance. I think it should be blamed on the director and maybe a little bit the editor, but mostly the director. <sighs> the film's not exciting. There are some like visually interesting moments, but it's just like nonsensical and pointless. There's no reason the camera needs to move the way it does or show the way it shows things. And if I went the rest of my life without watching that film, I'm not really sure I would be sad, honestly. <sighs> but I watched it, so uh, there's that.